webinar and today's lectures. And good evening to you all. Uh, my name is Anna Kodba. I think that some of you maybe remember me from uh, course two, those of you who, of course, were uh, attending participants of course two, because there I was in charge of explaining you um, assignments uh, that were, and also course one, uh, that were uh, during the presentations from Professor Neven Duic and Professor Tomislav Pukšev. So today, in this webinar, we will talk about proactive community on engaging for environment and energy costs. Uh, as I said, my name is Anna uh, Kodva. I work as a research and project assistant at Faculty of Mechanical Engineering and Naval Architecture here at the University of Zagreb. Uh, and we are, together with our partners, we are a partner of this on this Erasmus project. So let's dive in into the webinar. So today we would talk about um, stakeholder engagement in energy and climate actions planning. And this is one topic which is uh, to me, I would say quite close because um, in, during the um, two years ago, we ended the project, uh, which uh, whose uh, main focus was stakeholder engagement and multi-level governance in uh, energy and climate actions planning. And there we act as coordinator, but also we were part of creation a task force where we were um, quite engaged in the development of uh, SECAP for some creation cities, which were part of this, uh, which were part of this project. So uh, I will go a bit into some details on how, uh, on some of the findings uh, we had in the scope of this project, but something which will, which is, I would say, applicable to, in general, climate communication, especially energy and climate communication uh, in uh, energy and climate action planning. Uh, I will present to what we call the communication ladder. I will share some tips and tricks on climate communication. And I will, as today, the idea is that we talk about proactive communities. I will present you a case study on proactive community. So first, uh, just to be on the same page and to um, understand to what I refer when, when I'm um, explaining some uh, planning, um, plan, uh, planning um, and uh, some action uh, plans. I would like just to you get familiar with this initiative in case if you're not familiar with this. The name of the initiative is the Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy Planning, uh, for Climate and Energy. It's also called COM. And this is an ambition initiative for local climate and energy actions. And it aims to convey um, local authorities to voluntarily commit to implement sustainable policies on their territories. So, um, Cities, as it's written, they are not obliged to take part of this, um, uh, to be part of this initiative. But uh, there is a really a huge number of cities in Europe, and now the initiative is going on worldwide. Uh, and the currency of the initiative counts more than 10,000 signatories. And you can see here on the map of Europe, also you can see with Asia, um, how uh, how many cities are part uh, of this. Um, the, the the cities which are part of this initiative. Uh, so in the scope of this initiative, uh, one of the objectives for all of, uh, of the initiative and also one of the requirements for those who are part in this initiative is to develop sustainable energy climate action plan. This is called SECAP. Previously, uh, in the earlier phase of the initiative, until 2022, it was sustainable energy action plan. It's called SEAP, maybe you are more familiar with this term because it was quite, uh, let's say, popular. SECAP is more um, novel term and novel plans. And the, uh, the idea is to tackle mitigation and adaptation to climate change. And uh, the cit uh, cities and municipalities need to define actions um, and measures that allow cutting down at least 40% of CO2 emissions by the year of 2030 and uh, to be in line with uh, Green Deal. Uh, those uh, those uh, requirements and those ambitions are expected to go even higher to become 55% of CO2 uh, emission by the year 2030. Uh, in addition, to, in the scope of this plan, uh, the signatories need to develop risk and vulnerability assessment of the effects of climate change in order to highlight strengths and weakness of territory. So those of you who were um, also attending course two, you heard more in details uh, with uh, from to Professor Thomas of about risk and vulnerability assessment. But what is here important to highlight? 
the important to highlight is that those ambitions are really quite high. Um, they are, um, they are, let's say, uh, quite uh, challenging to achieve, and uh, they um, they require a huge um, a huge effort from all stakeholders. And although the municipalities or cities are in part of developing this plan, if they act only on um, on the measures in sectors when they where they have uh, complete um, authority, let's say, then of course it is not impossible to achieve those savings because to achieve those huge savings, maybe they don't look so huge, but they're quite huge. Uh, they really need uh, effort and contributions by all sectors and by all citizens and other relevant stakeholders. So what do we uh, did we done in the scope of this project? We developed this, let's say, so-called pentahelic methodology, where uh, in the process, not of the tech up development like in the later phase, but in the really very early phase of the tech up development, we included representatives of five, let's say, pillars of uh, what we call a pentahelic. So these were, of course, citizens, NGOs, uh, business businesses and industry, public authorities, and academia. So um, in this process, depending on the target group, uh, we organized public consultations, public workshops, uh, but also we or which are more like for general public, but we also organized task force uh, meetings, which were more um, focused on uh, having like meetings with a smaller group uh, of people, let's say from 20 to let's say maximum 30 people, where representative of different uh, re different pillars were there, and uh, together with also those public consultation with bigger uh, workshops, uh, all of them were uh, talking about what they want to see in their city, what will be um, measures for that, and uh, what how can they contribute. And uh, this with these measures, uh, they cover uh, let's say energy efficiency, energy production, energy consumption, and transportation, and also other sectors which are included in SECA. Uh, so, um, what is why is this re stakeholder involvement process important? As I said, stakeholder uh, municipalities can definitely not achieve those ambitions if they do these uh, actions, implement the action by themselves, because uh, they don't have resources in terms of money, in terms of time, in terms of stuff, but also they don't have control under uh, many sectors which should be which should implement uh, measures to achieve those savings. So uh, to tell a bit uh, briefly about how these uh, task force meetings in cities and municipalities were organized uh, and how was this co-creative uh, co process uh, implemented is that sometimes stakeholders uh, were there to propose their vision of the cities, their measures to mitigate and adapt to the impact of climate change. Um, for those, stakeholders which were not so maybe familiar with some concrete measures and they did not know to how to uh, let's say um, they did not know to how to specifically define the measure this was maybe too challenging for them they say okay maybe I'm not I don't know how which measures will achieve this but I know that this is the need of the city to achieve certain things uh, and then we all of us can talk what will be the measures which will which will address this need. Also, what the stakeholders for sure know is what are their needs, what are the, their needs of them as citizens, as NGOs, as academia, or as business sector, and especially as local authorities. So uh, once um, they define the needs and then all together define those measures, which are part of the action plan, uh, all together members of the task force, but also public consultation, comment and modify the proposed measures. Uh, and once measures are uh, modified and, and defined, then uh, one very important uh, step is to define which are the stakeholders and the stakeholders group responsible for the implementation of certain measures. And here it is important, really important, that those stakeholders which are responsible for the implementation of certain measures should also be included in this process of uh, co-creation of and uh, one, uh, I would say maybe a last step, but I would say most important step is that they cooperate during the implementation of measures. Um, 
some of the advantages from this stakeholder cooperation um, in comparison with what I would say is unfortunately current practice is that one uh, consultancy company or some regional energy agency, they develop, um, they develop SECAP. And quite often those SECAPs are quite similar from one municipality to other, from one city to other. And they are not, as we will say, tailor-made and um, stakeholders were not properly involved, but they were more like once the SECAP is defined, maybe they saw it and they can some send some comments, but often this was also even not the case. So some of the advantages from stakeholder cooperation that it's uh, especially in when the multi-governance um, cooperation takes place, there is a suitable uh, governance arrangements because to implement, of course, some actions you really need uh, the you really need um, um, support from local authorities, from regional authorities, and if possible from national authorities. Uh, when when a, there's a group of people aiming to achieve certain measures, aiming to implement them in their families, um, in their company, uh, etc., then uh, resources in times of in terms of time, money, data, sometimes data because also setup needs to be quite a lot of data for the development, they are available, and especially the knowledge, because everybody knows, let's say, the best, what is critical for their sector, for their pillar. Uh, one important thing is to in, uh, understand internal drivers and barriers of the stakeholders, which can be only fully understood if you sit with people, if you talk with them, and if you listen to them and, um, and uh, have, a, and they see that you really want to know what are their drivers and also what are their barriers. Uh, it is also a great place uh, and uh, some of the advantage to break some kind of myths regarding certain um, certain measures, uh, energy and climate measures. Also, there's a better insight to the data and uh, let's say uh, uh, there is a ground for win-win solution. So to see how can, what can I do for municipalities or for city, but also how can I benefit from this measure, or maybe how municipality can support me in implementing these measures in um, promoting my, in um, making my business better. Uh, so what is also one, uh, some of the advantages is that when um, climate and energy planning um, are, take, are done properly on the municipality level, um, and not only the setups from different cities are copy paste, is that there is a step um, above, above and there is a moving away from generic measures, uh, which are like the same from all, for all cities towards measures which are adopted to the city needs and also to the stakeholder needs. And also uh, there is a broader picture of the impact of certain measures on other sectors. For example, uh, what I, uh, for me, what was one interesting experience in uh, one creation city, we had these uh, task force meetings and there, this city has quite big issue with floods, and we were talking about the floods. And even though we did not, um, maybe let's say, expect that district heating is so affected by the floods, the representatives of district heating sector explained us that they really have a huge issues with floods because their infrastructure is underground, and um, the, the issues with water sometimes highly damage the infrastructure. Um, Furthermore, there is increasing social involvement in the implementation of CO2 reduction and climate change adaptation measures because pe people feel they were part of this uh, planning and they then also would like to, uh, they are more likely to commit. Uh, there is improved co coordination of the implementation of measures because sometimes different groups, you guys specifically refer to NGOs, they are making some kind of um, uh, energy promotion. Uh, workshops and um, when like we sit all together and see who is doing who is doing what, then also those measures can be implemented um, coordinated better. Uh, and there, what is I would say very important is that finally the, the plan that shows realistic and preferred measures uh, and at the same time serves to attract investment. And it is not as it is too often I would say a wish list. So. Um, when we talk about energy, um, environmental and energy measures, what we notice, uh, I'm um, personally from this, um, uh, I work in this, let's say, field, uh, my background is power engineering and energy engineering. And often in um, when implementing different measures, let's say 
building a renew, uh, um, renew, uh, a renewable energy plant, um, like biomass plant, etc., um, or any kind or different types of the infrastructure building. There are several phenomena which are recognized. And first is very famous NIMBY effect, which is uh, which is uh, which stands for not in my backyard. So this is a fact I believe most of you heard about this when um, people agree with some measures, they would like this measure to be implemented, but they don't want that it is implemented near them because they are concerned that this may affect uh, the quality of light, the quality of air, um, noise, etc. There is also one, um, let's say, new phenomena which is um, mentioned, which is being mentioned more and more in the literature. It may be sounds, let's say, a bit um, unusual and to some extent funny, uh, which is build absolutely nothing, no, and build absolutely nothing anywhere near anyone. Uh, this is more phenomenon related to when um, people are don't want not only that it is not some infrastructure is not built close to them. They don't want that it is built near, near to anything. So to overcome these uh, phenomena, which ha which are happening. Uh, a lot of things should be implemented, but some of them are education um, to for people to be familiar with uh, how this will what will be the impact to not just like rely on some uh, information they heard from maybe newspaper or from their neighbors, but sort of on the information which are reliable and true. Uh, also, from the side of the company, what is uh, extremely important is that they ensure best available technology that. It will be in light with all requirements. Uh, communication, meaningful engagement, success stories, demonstration, long-term engagement, and relationship building. To what I'm referring to as a meaningful engagement. Often engagement can be uh, presented as any kind of information. So let's say, um, I don't know, citizens are informed uh, or they maybe are invited to some workshops, but there they really don't have some possibility to um, say what they have their say on that, but they more like inform, okay, this will be built, this will be built. This is not meaningful engagement. This is not through communication. This is only informing people, which uh, for this kind of um, uh, environmental and energy topic is not sufficient. Uh, so uh, so now on, in line with that, I would like to talk a bit about, about what we say, the communication letters, which the president, which is presented in this picture. And uh, first of all, in this communication letter, we need to look at why we why climate communication and communication in general is necessary. What is their purpose of communication? What is the difference between conveying fact and knowledge and uh, changing uh, attitudes and getting people to change their behavior? And maybe the most important, why would people take part in this co-creation process? So here, when I was explaining this, communication letter, I would, I try to be, let's say, more gen, uh, more generic because I think that what is presented here can really be applied to a wide range of situation um, of uh, community communi communications, but uh, maybe I would refer the most like to this, uh, what we also implemented in the project when, where the community was engaged in the SECAP, in the climate and energy planning development. But as I said, this, um, this principle are um, stands for, for other types of situations. Okay, so first, uh, if you would think about what is, you know, first, why would stakeholders, of course, take part in cooperation, not only in energy and climate uh, planning cooperation, but in general, in all different type of cooperation activities. So why they would do this? Uh, and uh, to ensure, ensure them that this is something uh, meaningful and uh, that this is some serious activity, uh, here are some tips. So, it, uh, for example, if uh, stakeholders are invited to meeting for co-creation activities, it is important to show them that the meeting is serious activity that is well encoded in the municipalities or maybe in some organization. For instance, by having the mayor or CEO, CEO sign the invitation to the first meeting, especially if it's, let's say, um, for some case when I don't know where uh, some um, renewable energy plant is being built and like citizens are invited to uh, to co-creation um, process or, or example in this um, climate and energy planning. 
it is very beneficial to have the mail or to have the CEO, CEO at this meeting because sometimes we um, we think that if those let's say relevant personnel from specific organizations organization and city if they appear at this meeting, they then then they um, consider this meeting important, and therefore we can also consider this important. Uh, the second one is um, to emphasize the benefit of taking part in the task force or in different kinds of meetings, for instance, by showing the citizens that they are main beneficiaries of energy and climate measure implementations. And finally, uh, I would say that uh, for all of us people, I, our maybe most valuable asset is our time. So um, it is crucial to show to the stakeholders that their effort is appreciated and that their input is taken seriously. And this taken seriously is um, it's really one crucial thing because uh, people feel when you, let's say, manipulate them, when you um, when you ask for their contribution pro forma, and when they see that what they provide is not taken seriously or not taken at all. For example, uh, sometimes, um, well, all, let's say, national uh, uh, energy plans or different types of uh, action plans developed on the national level uh, they need to be, by law, there should be uh, public consultations. And sometimes we also, in our energy planning group, when this action plan um, is finalized, when it is published online and in the public consultation process, um, we write some comments and also NGOs are usually quite engaged with this. But if you see that none of those comments are really addressed, then with the time you will lose the motivation to provide input because you see that this input is not, not taken seriously and it is also, um, yeah, it is all just done pro forma so somebody can tick the box that they did this as it was required. Also, what it is uh, important to say is that um, the, the timing of the input really matters because we are aware that so if somebody uh, develop something, uh, some document or um, some, let's say, feasibility, pre-feasibility, feasibility study for some construction. And then at the end, they ask you for their input. You can be, let's say, quite sure that your input will not make some significant change because the process when the significant change could take place was in quite earlier phase. So this is very important to have in mind when communicating with the stakeholder that their input is taken seriously. Um, when uh, communicating with people, uh, it is um, to attract them and to also get them on board. It is always great to start with a positive vision that catches uh, attention. So um, people, as I said, sometimes maybe they don't have some ideas on some concrete measures, but they often have an idea on the vision uh, they have for the city or maybe for their neighbor, for the street, et cetera. So it is important to ask stakeholders on their vision and to visualize their vision and to refer to places and areas to which this vision applies. And here it is important to avoid statistics and diagrams. It is more important to this um, vision. And uh, climate and energy plans, which communicate successfully, always start with a positive vision for the future. And it is uh, better to start, we see also in our work, but also it has been recognized by different experts that uh, it is better to uh, describe the positive vision and not describe the misery, the surroundings, or the challenges of our trends that most, um, uh, let's say, climate plans present. Okay, so. Great results uh, rely on small measures from everyone. So we need to get um, whatever action is being implemented. We need to get people to participate by pointing out that great results will come if everyone does their share, even though it's quite small. So here we, I mentioned just a few examples, waste reduction, energy savings, use of uh, resources, buying less, but more expensive and better, economy, health and mobility. And what I, uh, there is um, like one figure, I saw it on the internet and they say like regarding waste reduction, uh, we don't need like a lot of people, we don't need a small number of people making perfect waste reduction, we need a lot of people making imperfect waste reduction. And attitudes will change if we are motivated to share our behavior, if we get curious and if we are thirsty for more knowledge about climate change or in general topics we are 
uh, we want to co-create, uh, we want to engage stakeholders. Um, so, as I said, um, if we to achieve these results, we need new habits and pre requirements for new habits are having knowledge, uh, desired change and having the opportunity. If case if those preconditions um, appear, then we could start training new habits. It still me doesn't mean that we have those new habits that it is just a pre uh, request that we can start training them. So here, maybe not so related to uh, climate communication, but I somehow I really wanted to include this because um, because our life is essentially some of our habits and the life of uh, stakeholders is uh, some of our habits. So to make some meaningful change in our behavior, we need to start with new habits. And here I wanted to include some findings from Atomic Habits uh, book, uh, which is I personally find it very I personally like it a lot. In my opinion, it is um, one of the best books I ever read. And I, if you if you didn't read this book, I will I would um, recommend you because it is really very good book for uh, for self improvement. So the author James Clear recognizes that habits work like this. We need to have like this circle uh, to to make some habits. And uh, first, we have the cue. The cue trigger is a craving, which motivates a response, which provides a reward, which satisfies the craving, and ultimately becomes associated with the cue. Uh, so here, you can on the right you have an uh, example to um, like cue your common buzzes with the new text message. Craving you want to learn the context of the message. Response is that you grab your phone and read the text, and reward is to satisfy your craving to read the message. And this is um, oh, this is slightly off topic, but in psychology, they say that our like our high level of dopamine is when we are expecting something. So uh, the, the, the reward is that you achieve this dopamine because you satisfy your craving to read this message and grabbing the phone as, uh, becomes associated with your phone button. So when our phone buzz, we act, we automatically grab it. But uh, even though we have some good and bad habits, uh, there is system to make some good habits, which is like make it obvious, make it attractive, make it easy, make it great. And here I did not specify how to implement this to some new habits because it is uh, really quite, uh, it, can, it should be implemented case by case scenario. But I think it is uh, interesting here to see uh, how how to act to um, to motivate people and to show them how to start with some good ha habits. Okay, so regarding the communication ledger, the next step is the target group. Who? So, uh, who do we want to communicate to? How do we find the right target groups? Uh, and the, when defining the target groups, it is really um, important to be true to their choice. So, they are also sometimes not definable in terms of demographic because some Sometimes people who are, let's say, about building new houses, you uh, those with a lot of knowledge about climate issues, issues. They can be, let's say, one target group, but the others which are not so familiar, they can be uh, the second target group, etc. So uh, what uh, what we notice is that the, when you try to convince the skeptic, that it really takes a lot of effort. Uh, so sometimes it is, let's say, better to uh, to adhere to uh, adhere to be and target language and words. To, um, it is really important to adjust your uh, target language and words to the target group. And uh, what, I, what I refer to is that it is important to find out what your type the target group is also concerned about, adapt your word uh, channels and messages, and convince, as I said, convince skeptics takes tons of effort. And also, it is quite uh, it is very good to consider finding different spokesperson for different different uh, target groups. So, how to involve different target groups? It really sometimes it's really there is a need to um, implement different type of approaches for different um, groups, target groups. For example, um, how to uh, motivate and how to evolve uh, citizens. So here it is uh, what we noticed is that, and also what the literature, uh, what is also reported in the literature for the citizens, it is important that we focus on local topics and uh, have an engagement speaker about the topic which is close to their heart or meeting people on arenas when they are already are present, where they are already present. Uh, for industry, industry often prefers like quite efficient meetings with clear goals, 
focusing on consequences, costs, and especially for possibilities for funding. We noticed that uh, when working with industry, uh, they are, when we start talking about pos uh, possibility of for funding, which their um, in, which their business can have in case if they select some um, energy and climate uh, measures, then they start to be quite interested. NGOs often have very clear defined issues that are willing, uh, they are fighting for, and will usually usually appreciate the opportunity to cooperate with. And the public sector is um, quite limited with the um, uh, staff uh, and time, uh, but uh, they can be. They are usually more interested if they see that their collaboration in the scope of some activity, some um, actions. Uh, will benefit in terms of um, achieving international, national, and regional tar targets. So this can be a good starting for point for them. Uh, the agriculture sector prefers to have time and room for dialogue and see a value in meeting people face to face. Uh, and timing for them, it is quite important the timing of the meeting, uh, of the meeting with respect to the growing and harvesting seasons, hunting seasons, etc. Uh, academic stuff. Stakeholders have interested in meeting other stakeholders for possible collaboration, like in research, in um, maybe applying for some new projects, but they're also interested in learning situations where which can they which they can present to their students. Uh, so the third step is what? What do we want to communicate? What arguments shall we use? So um Often when we talk about some energy and some climate topics, um, we try to communicate uh, visible consequences of climate change that are happening far away from where we live and where we breathe, so where we live. So we try to, for example, uh, engage people by telling them about consequences about climate change that will happen in the future, or maybe that happened in the tar in Antarctic, about serious effects that will occur in different parts of the world. And this is quite a mistake because it is um, difficult um, to use consequences for a target group and especially consequences which are not so uh, which are not um, which are not affecting them particularly so much uh, the people who are generally concerned about climate change will be more engaged in the consequences but to reach most people it is important to bring the message let's say close to home a message that is abstract and complex is because a message that is abstract and complex is not convincing. So um, it is uh, how to co communicate. It is always better to try instead of finding examples of climate changes that is uh, find, find examples of climate change that is happening now in uh, our city or our municipality. And then it is much easier to get people engaged in issues that are close to them in time and in space. Uh, so there's also um, there. Let's say we can have two major groups of the of the messages. We can have like um, positive messages, but also we can have this let's say guilty tripping measures. For example, you're a polluter. True, you should drive your car less, try to fly less. You need to ride your bike back more and take the bus vacation close to home, etc. So uh, these kind of restriction restriction messages sometimes do not motivate people uh, as much as we would like to have them. Uh, they, they can be of great value if restrictions are, are really urgent and needed, but if we, um, uh, if we take something for people or beneficial or ordering people to do something, it is always important to say, do, we offering, do they have something to offer instead? And how effective is uh, giving people a, a guilty consequences? And what is the, we always need to ask ourselves, what is the most effective way to bring about change, to motivate or to intimidate people to change their behavior? And um, what has been proven, it works best, is that praise works best. And uh, this is something which uh, parents also are familiar quite a lot with and also supervisors. And uh, it is always somehow more motivating uh, for people to not let's say, putting the figure uh, in terms of you should do that, you should do that, you should not do that. But um, it is always good to see, like, in more positive light in terms of what is in there for me, how can it benefit people uh, we are talking to, uh, why would they 
what is the benefit for them? Is this better health? Is this saving money? Is this incorporating air quality, saving time, etc. So um, the last step on the community communication ladder is how to implement communication. So what media would be appropriate? Should we use the media more on how we will follow on uh, the measures that are set in motion? And how also very important, how we will communicate those measures. So as I already mentioned, uh, there is a really important uh, to ensure collaboration uh, during the whole process. And as I said, the collaboration is not when we say collaboration, it doesn't mean to uh, present to people information, but really to take the input and be generally interested in what they have to say. Uh, it is important to create a good meeting place, which is reachable for all of our target group, and also that uh, it is in the timing uh, of the target, that the timing fits the target group. And here, um, something like this, although maybe sometimes in, it's not so uh, much, uh, let's say, it's not so much taken into consideration, but for example, in this project which we implemented, we noticed that we cannot have in the, you know, we cannot have um, on the same meeting, let's say, um, gen, uh, citizens in general uh, and uh, some industry representative which come as their, which uh, join the meeting as a representative of industry because uh, they have they prefer to do this in the working hours, while well, of course citizens um, prefer to uh, have join these um, kinds of meetings and workshops in time when they are in the evening hours when they are at home when they are not at the work. So uh, to have um, to fully understand uh, people, it is uh, very important to ask questions to understand and to present them that. Um, you are very interested in their perspective and their vision. And as I already said, yeah, it is uh, important to not just inform, but communicate and uh, not to uh, make uh, the communication tailor-made and uh, because not uh, all, no size fits all. Uh, so um, think when talking about uh, some measures and uh, when motivating people to implement some additional measures, it is crucial to think about what has been already done. And uh, the closer we get to the everyday love for people, the better they, they will be more motivated. So, uh, so uh, what, what people are not interested in is, for example, that um, for example, climate and energy measures may deal with, let's say, complex team, let it's complex uh, procedures with some uh, mayor issues, with uh, some public tender, uh, tendering issues. People are not, uh, people do, do not really care about the debt, that care what will make a difference in their everyday life. The most important thing is that people notice what you um, People notice what you have done and what you say, and that you do as you say. And um, it is to implement this. It is really also uh, important to make the message simple, so uh, everybody, all to, uh, all the considered uh, target group, can understand the message. And also to um, communicate, to improve communications, to improve the reach of the communications. Uh, it is always very beneficial to include media. And to get media attention, it is wise to use existing cases to illustrate cl climatic issues and, uh, for example, which are already existing in cities, such as um, heat waves, traffic jams, uh, or different types of climatic energy issues. Uh, okay. So uh, what people uh, like to see and how they are more motivated is if they see some effect effects. So something which is not very um, challenging to understand, which is quite straightforward to them. For example, here I presented, uh, included some uh, figures on how uh, LED light lights uh, compared to the traditional uh, lights, uh, how much energy it saves. Or here you can see how many, uh, how implementation of uh, some activities can um, can benefit people in terms of uh, more in terms of more the uh, product they produce, better benefit, uh, et cetera. So uh, to, um, to have a meaningful communication, uh, it is um, important to 
to have clear language. So plain uh, language is prerequisite for their success. And every we notice that every profession has this jargon, especially this um, refers to industry. And sometimes if industry is um, explaining something to citizens which are not in this field, uh, citizens, they don't understand um, this language. And uh, sometimes they do not feel comfortable saying, can you please explain this? I don't understand because they feel that maybe it will seem like they are not um, very smart and that uh, people may well, maybe have some bad thoughts about them. But uh, this this really is extremely important that clear language is being used and that language that everybody understands uh, can uh, is used and that we all put ourselves in the recipe's place and that we use uh, what is called active language, that we don't talk in the passive language, like it should be done, um, it, it's supposed to be done, but that we talk about who should done this. I should, I'm doing this, you should do this in the end of this. So that it is um, it is very clear what is our message and what are our responsibilities. So um, there are really quite a lot of channels to choose from uh, when we talk about communication. So after we define target group, we need to analyze uh, which which channels should be uh, used to reach um, to reach the target groups. So we have um, here you can see uh, posters, TVs, radio, letters, emails, Facebook, Instagram, maybe. This is slightly updated, you can also include here TikTok and uh, those new channels which um, youngsters are using, and uh, of course, websites and other channels. So it is really important to see what the target group is using and to implement uh, those communications through those channels. Okay. So uh, now we'll talk a bit about, um, let's say, nudging and the good case. So. A nudge is a push in the right direction, and it involves influencing people to get them to make new choices, new choices without having them to think too much about them. So um, this can be useful in climate change work to help people uh, make more uh, climate friendly choices. And here, um, just one as one example, we can add check boxes to a Christie contract to help consumers make some eco-friendly choices, for example, to select green electricity. Or we can, in our office requirement, preset copiers and printers to print double-sided uh, copies. And then like every um, every change of this, uh, like printing one-sided copies will require additional effort. And this is, to some extent, one barrier. And uh, then uh, the possibility that this will happen will be quite lower. And also we can install bicycle racks next to the entrance to the building, which will, because if people have better um, transport uh, connection uh, for their bicycles, they are more, um, they are more motivated and more, they will more probably use those uh, means of transportation. Uh, we have here, we listed uh, four different types of nudge. So this is information, pre-selected standard uh, alternative, change the physical environment and also feedback and uh, social norms. So uh, here now I will present one case study on one proactive community. So maybe some of you heard about it. Here I selected one, let's say quite famous um, example. And this is a transition town Totnes, which is located uh, in uh, Totnes, United Kingdom. And the town's uh, residents came together to create a more sustainable and resilient community focusing on the environment and energy costs. And their aim uh, was to reduce uh, carbon emissions, uh, but also to increase local self-reliance. Reliance. So not only in terms of, um, in terms of um, energy, but also in terms of money. So for example, they developed some analysis where they noticed that they use um, 30 million uh, pounds for food on an annual basis and that 20 million of those of this is being um, is being, being spent in supermarkets. So they uh, calculated this, they presented those figures to um, the citizens and then they, they explained that only like 10 percent of 10 um, percent of shifting those spendings from uh, supermarkets to uh, local uh, stores or uh, local market will bring two million pounds more to local economy, which re which makes really a significant significant impact 
and this is, as I said, two more million pounds, two million pounds annually more for them economy without any grants, without any big, um, without any, uh, let's say, big changes to the residents. So some of the key actions taken uh, by Transition Town Totnes is that uh, the community developed uh, an energy decent action plan, which outlined a roadmap for reducing energy consumption and transition to the renewable energy sources. And why were also people in, um, why are people engaged and why they are uh, following the plan? One of the reasons is that the hundreds of people were involved through sharing their vision of how they see uh, the town and their visions were taken seriously. They established a transition support group. Uh, they developed economic blueprint, uh, which, which is, I mentioned in examples, which mapped the potential of local economy. And they launched one interesting project, um, which is transition uh, streets communities. And to, I will now explain you a bit more about this uh, project. So this project has several steps. And um, it is based that uh, each street, um, uh, each street, each street starts their small community and or even more communities in their street. In, and it, that the first step is that initiate, initiator or for, uh, this transition street project in their street, they, um, they contact the, the support group, uh, support group of this project. And then they receive guidelines of how to implement this in their street. Uh, they receive some in, in, instructions and they, uh, they uh, made a group of six to eight uh, households, so they are neighboring households. And uh, the initiator um, organized the first meeting at their home. And uh, during that meeting, they uh, they talked together about explore a range of topics, including energy, food, travel, water, and resource use. So they used each meeting to focus more on one topic. And um, those meetings are. Um, those meetings are um, organized in their houses. Uh, so every time, uh, every time, uh, every time when they have a meeting, they have a meeting in some other house, uh, in some uh, other house, and then uh, they com um, they get to know each other. And as I was, I was uh, recently listening one tech talk when they explained this project, and then they say that what they see maybe as the most beneficial result of this project is not so much about the energy savings, about the measures implemented in those streets, but more about the connection between people which arise from that project. But apart from this connection, there is there are really a huge um, impact uh, from this project. So at the end of each of those meeting, meetings, um, they they make a pledge that uh, they will, this, in, by the next meeting, they will focus more on energy reduction, on removing food waste, etc. And then, uh, and then uh, by the next meeting, they really make efforts to to implement what they promise they will. And in this first phase of this project, um, which started I think around ten years ago, around five hundred households in Totnes cut an average of. Uh, 570 pounds from their annual household bill and 1.3 tons from their carbon footprint. So these figures are, uh, these figures are per households. And I believe that this is quite impressive, especially, especially because this is a project which is more uh, community, uh, which is pre, uh, full results of proactive community. So it's not a result of some big uh, funded project. It is a result of the communities which uh, which take an effort to uh, work together with their neighbors on on achieving a goals which they all together set. So um, to um, finalize these presentations, I included uh, instead of a conclusion. This is um, this is a screenshot from Microsoft Teams, and it was a. Uh, taken even before Corona uh, when Microsoft Teams were not so much used. But I, I really like um, what one uh, statement, which is listed there, and it states that it takes a village to turn ideas into realities. And from our work with in the scope of this project, but also, um, but also in the scope of other projects, for example, we, uh, we here we had one, one, um, 
Um, in Croatia, we have one case where um, there was plant, a uh, biomass regeneration plant was planned, biomass regeneration plant was planned. And uh, even though this is renewable energy source, at the end, the, the project was not implemented because it really did not have support of local community. So for all of these kind of um, um, or measures to be implemented, it really takes a village or city to turn it into reality. So uh, I would I would say that this is the end of my presentation. I know that from earlier um, from earlier um, seminars uh, you had quite a lot of que uh, questions. So I leave some quite a lot of uh, time also for us to for a discussion. So just to check if there are some questions at this moment. Um, sorry. No. Uh, so, if case if you have some questions, I still also need to present assignment, but I would like to do that we first go through questions and then that we uh, that we go on the assignment. So, does everybody anybody has some question on what I just presented? Um, if not. Darko, would it be fine that I start with a, a assignment explanation and then we can we can um, we can maybe go? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know that the questions are quite a lot about assignment, uh, but uh, I know also that sometimes people just wait for assignments to be explained. That's why I was thinking uh, that, that maybe first we go through questions, but okay, then we will uh, we will start with the assignment explanation. And uh, then, if some other questions arise, we can we can um, talk about it. Okay, so uh, here's your assignment, and the assignment is to prepare an action plan for improving. Um... Uh, did you ever want educate someone who did want to be educated? This is a challenge. Yeah, it is a really big challenge, and um, sometimes. Uh, what what we notice that this uh, process of uh, climate and energy uh, planning and communications, people who um, join this kind of um, meetings and are willing to co-create are, as we call it, usual suspects. So these are people who are already quite engaged, um, who are already quite engaged in this. Um, and um, and uh, and uh, they are they're already making, uh, they're already making um, yeah, some efforts. Uh, I personally uh, was not so much engaged uh, about education, somebody who didn't want to be educated, because usually types of the co-creative approaches and co-creative meetings we had were more like on voluntary basis. So if somebody wants to, uh, if somebody wants to um, join this meeting, then they really have some uh, some. Uh, motivation that uh, in these topics and that they want to be educated. For example, all of you who are here at the webinar, uh, you want to learn something more, uh, so you are here. But those who don't want, they are not here. So personally, I would say no, but um, uh, my boss is uh, Professor Nevan Duic, who is, uh, he is very, let's say, engaged in, uh, in he very, he's very engaged in educating people who don't want to be educated. If you maybe remember, he was uh, having his presentation on um, on Facebook um, trolls and on people who are uh, who having different kind of troll um, trolling kind of um, messages and posts. So yeah, my personal not because the the uh, the type of the meetings we had were not that kind. Even though I say I work at a faculty, so sometimes <laughs> I work also uh, I work also in teaching. So sometimes maybe some students don't want to be educated, but at least they hide this. Okay, uh, coming to the assignment. So the assignment is to prepare an action plan for improving uh, uh, for improving uh, public participation participation for real case identified in week one. But here just very, very, very important to say. The idea when we all prepared this was that these assignments have some, let's say, flow of um, a flow where you are dealing with uh, some case during the whole weeks. But maybe you selected some case for which it doesn't make sense that you have it here. 
or maybe you selected some case or where you feel it will be very complicated that you hear. Or uh, for me, this is completely fine and you are not obligatory to select the same case. It is, um, let's say, recommended to select the same case, but in case if you select some other case, it, it will not, you will not receive any negative points or you will, um, it will be treated the same like you selected the case which you have in first two weeks. So, um, Okay, the real I mentioned that you, you use the other project in weeks one and two, but uh, where there is other resolutions that not to start it ever, then not to start it ever. Uh, the Brilla, if you could please just um, uh, maybe explain me in, in more details. Uh, I, I think I did not fully understand your question. Uh, okay, Maya said that you also have this example that, that you will manage. As I said, this is up to you. If you want, you can have, you can select this case. If you don't want to, you don't need to select this case. So the title is uh, Action Plan for Improving Public Participation on Selected Situation, Not Selected Issues. You're here, um, what we um, are quite interested in is not like I would say form, but we are more interested in the measures you would like to present. So, um, uh, so, okay, under the title is the names of the students who work on the task. As a team, you are doing this already for this is uh, five, fifth course, so you're aware of that. And after that, provide the baseline assessment. I know that in one of the other assignments, this baseline assessment wording was maybe a bit complicated. So, um, just uh, I would say that the baseline assessment in this concrete case is just quite a brief explanation on the situations and the issue and its background. So, just uh, you don't need to say, you don't need to include any numbers. You just don't need to explain what is the current situation and or what is the issue. Um, what is the issue? Uh, and, um, what is the issue? And, uh, yeah, the, what is the current situation? As I said, just a sec. And now, after the battle and assessment, you can propose at least five measures which should aim to improve participation and solve the selected situation issues. So you don't uh, here, let's say uh, each measure, of course, will be described in detail. Um, here you can um, the pick one of the first. I don't know what. Um, yes, of this course, of this course. Yeah, yes, yes, Tamara. Uh, so you can, um, the focus is on, uh, the focus is on measures. So what I would like you the most here is to be, let's say, creative, uh, to be, let's say, creative or to focus on what is important when we talk about measures. Uh, measures. So for example, what uh, I, uh, what some, one of the measure, which I would say that is not maybe, considered as best measures in um, public participation uh, and communications is what I already said in my presentation, just to inform somebody, because it is uh, it is not really real uh, engagement and meaningful engagement. It is just uh, like what people do sometimes to tick the box. It is better than nothing, but again, this is not a meaningful explanation, uh, explanation. Uh, not explanation, but uh, engagement. So a uh, fright conclusion of the action plan. So just to briefly summarize, so what I would like to see in your assignment, I would like to see that you present a paragraph or two uh, or a small short section on the um, baseline assessment, so on the current situations on the topic you are interested in. Then uh, you propose uh, at least five measures which should aim to improve public uh, public participation and solve the selected situation issue. So you don't those measures are aiming to improve public participation and solve the selected issue. Of course, not all measures can solve the solve, and uh, there are some sometimes the issues and the cases which are you working on are so complex that it is not that like people spend uh, years to solve them. But the, here, what we would like to see and what is most important is that you define your measures that the intention that to for this to be solved is clear. And that it would that implementation of this measure would have some meaningful impact on solving this issue. And okay, writing at the end, just conclusion is also one paragraph where you where you um, where you 
conclude what you wrote in your action plan. So just what I didn't mention is that proposed a recommended number of words is up to 2,000 uh, 2, words. But again, this is just a recommended. It's not, um, if there are more words, it is, fully, it is uh, completely fine. So the, this is not very restrictive. Also the same with this case. It is not, uh, you don't need to really, uh, if you see that this will not work for you, for you, you don't need to select the case in that fight in week one. Uh, okay, just to go briefly to questions, so she see if I didn't miss, miss anything. Yeah, the project in week two. Whether there is other resolution than not to start it there. I think that we cannot really resolve it in that. Okay, I mean, as I double, I think that uh, maybe I resolved your question. Uh, you said that you cannot really resolve it in a way that all stakeholders are on the same page. Um, maybe some, I think quite often there are um, solutions for win win. A ground that like uh, people are like say maybe not fully on the same page, but they all of them have see some benefits from this. So, uh, so um, but in case if you don't have idea, this even uh, suggestions some uh, measures which whose implementation will lead to um, to solving this uh, will be accepted. Okay, week one of this course, yes. Okay, of this one two weeks ago, yes. So are there any questions about the, these presentations or in general about the assignment? Okay, if not, uh, if not immediately, uh, I know that I noticed also in the last courses that sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, questions arise when you are um, implementing your um, implementing your assignment and you're writing your assignment. I remember with uh, SG um, assignment, there were quite a lot of questions. So also uh, that's why I wanted to be, let's say, more clear with explanation of this assignment. Uh, yes, so uh, <laughs> uh, Maya, uh, you can put, uh, just a sec, can we put different subtitles if we can fix the problem with a common measure? For example, public activation and then some measures and then public investment. Yes, yes, yes. You can, um, you can, uh, you can do it like this, like my proposal. You can put like for public activation some measures and then for public awareness different measures. This is completely fine. Thank you for your lecture. You gave us premise for some ideas for some. Oh, Madden, I'm very happy to to uh, to hear that. Are there or are there more questions on this? As I said, if not immediately, I I am available on forum. Uh, I prefer more, um, let's say, emails because sometimes I notice emails earlier. But I will do my best in the next uh, week to regularly check for forums so in case if you have some uh, questions, then you can, then you can, um, then you can, uh, then I can answer to them. Uh, if this is, uh, if the, these are all questions, I would like to finalize, uh, I would like to finalize this webinar. Uh, and once again, thank you all for joining the webinar and also for joining the, this course. I understand that maybe uh, it is already course five. So, uh, and you're hearing, you're listening webinars every week and you're making assignments. So I'm, uh, I see that, I see that some names here are the same those who I heard uh, in uh, so in um, course one and course two, so congratulations to you because you are really, I see, motivated uh, to learn more and to to improve your knowledge on this. So yes, I said we'll be in touch uh, on emails, on forums, uh, and I'm here there for you in case if you want some any additional literature or if you have any questions regarding the assignment. Thank you all, and we'll be in touch. Bye. Good night.